You know, the internet is really fucked up these days because of all of this shit. There's one thing about COVID, just kidding. There's lots of things about COVID that are awful. Um, I don't know if anybody's been out there protesting or anything. I don't know how that's uh, been going. I, I've been working on the weekend, so I haven't been able to join in, but I would love to. Um, we're just going to wait for, oh, there we go. We're about to go live. Come on, internet. Don't fail me now. Come on, man. Oh, yes, Tim Williams. You got it. I love What's it. up? You're live right now, dude. Everybody's watching you. You sound great. You look great. Everything's fucking fantastic. Oh, thank you. I've been working all <laughs> Where are you night. at right now? You guys caught me. You caught, you caught me right in the ass. What, are you recording? Yeah, you see all those? You see all those fucking takes? Shit, dude. What are you recording? It just says, just says, just says Tim everywhere. Um, <laughs> just some stuff. I'm going to go outside, though, because it's pretty hot in here. Hopefully, uh, I won't lose the signal. How you guys doing? All right, man. How, uh, what are you recording? Uh, just some stuff I've been writing. I've been working on some, like, uh, it's this project I got into, actually, as this whole pandemic just started, because I, uh, I just started writing a lot of shit. So, I don't know. It's still going all right. That's How's cool, man. That? I personally had a lot of, I had a lot of trouble. It's perfect, man. I had a lot of trouble being creative during this time just because like it was so stressful, you know, like, right. it, and like having the kids home and stuff like that. It's just like fucking like, uh, bananas. yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it is bananas. The whole, the homeschooling yeah. thing is such a fucking joke, dude. It's like ridiculous. My kids rip the house apart daily. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> you really, you really have to, uh, you have to exercise some major, major patience. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, man. Uh, fuck, I haven't seen you in a couple of years. I don't think. Yeah, it's I been a while. Know. You know. Uh, so, where are you right now? Where are you? Uh, where are you living? Uh, I live. In, I live in the Bronx. That's where oh, I the live. Bronx. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it's good. We like it up here. We've been here for a few years now, and uh, things are pretty good. You know, it's a little, it's hard to believe, but there's a little more space up here as opposed to uh, Brooklyn, right. you know, and uh, uh, we kind of just wound up here. I wouldn't say luck, but it was definitely chance. And uh, we, we really fell in love with the neighborhood and we were, we were in a, in a good position to uh, move in. Awesome, man. Killer. So, uh, yeah. I mean, what's, what's up with, I mean, we can, go into your projects right now so is this thing you're working on it's just your own music or yeah i would say that you know it's it's interesting I, I i took a long time to get this off the ground i've always wanted to do something you know but it just it, it really took i need i needed some help developing my vision and i, I went through a lot of different uh bands a lot of different projects and, and a lot of opportunities that from one shape, form, or another, I would always wind up walking away from. Not necessarily the people I was with. It was just like kind of maybe I got cold feet or maybe I just wasn't feeling it, you know. Uh, at this point in my career and where I'm at, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm doing it from, for me and I'm doing it because I want to create my art and uh, I still have that urge to do so. But uh, I got to be behind it and I, I got to be excited about it. And uh, this, is the, this, this, this time... <laughs> I'm pretty excited. I have one other guy, which is cool because it, it's tough to work with a lot of people. And uh, it, it's going. I, I'm, I'll just leave it that I'm excited about it, and it's. A, I think it's. I think it's going to be good. Killer man, yeah. You've always been incredibly particular about uh, <laughs> like the people that you work with and the labels you were on and all of that stuff. It's uh, you know, and uh, do you feel that like that is a little bit from your background in the in the Long Island hardcore scene where you know like like a little bit of rebellious punk nature where you're like fuck that I don't I don't feel it like I totally get the idea of like if you don't feel it man you shouldn't do it it's like it's pointless you know but sometimes like you know Blood Simple was on a major label sometimes it becomes your job and you know it's like shit yeah. I gotta do this I don't want to do this you know and, and you know it's uh it's just an it's, it's an interesting balance to fucking deal with so with that being said I want to I want to fucking reel it back to 1992. Um, 
Uh-huh. And uh, I, I, I'm trying to remember. I saw you guys. Vision of this would be VOD, of course. Um, I think I saw you guys at the right track in multiple times, and it was the weirdest fucking scene because it was like all these kids who, you know, because we had our our version of the Long Island hardcore scene, and you guys weren't quite integrated into it yet. And and we would go. To, I remember all going yeah. with Artie to these shows. And it would be like the entire fucking, you know, 13th grade of Nassau Community College showed up <laughs> to see you guys play. And it was, it was phenomenal. It was phenomenal. I mean, I think I might have even seen you at the time when you guys were still doing like Pantera covers. And it was, uh, but it was always so fucking heavy and so cool. And one of my favorite memories of you uh, and VOD was when the first time I already booked you guys at the Angle. And you were on stage and Artie just turned to me and he goes, this band's going to be fucking huge. This guy is fucking awesome. You were like prowling the stage. It was fucking cool as shit. And it was like, I, we just knew. And, you know, then I think you, you might have given us one of your demos at that point. And we reviewed it in Paranoid and all that other shit. But, I mean, like you guys were just like, let, let's talk about that time. Like, am I correct in saying that you guys weren't quite integrated into the scene yet? But if it, it didn't take very long. But, you know, it. Yeah, you're you're absolutely correct. Um, we were definitely not integrated. I remember going to shows and seeing at Hotel Leningrad. I think that's what they called it. And the seeing angle, you yeah. guys play like Neglect, uh, seeing Mind Over Matter, and us kind of being just a bunch of kids on the outskirts of the pit. I think a couple of of us got into a fight with Eddie Reyes. <laughs> and uh, we were definitely we were yeah we were not integrated you know and we were we were looking at you guys like holy shit we gotta we gotta get in and get on board with whatever these guys are doing because this this is really really great but we were definitely not integrated you guys were doing Leningrad and you kind of had the indie punk thing going on and you had the neglect and the disciplinary actions and the berserkers of the world and we just weren't a part of that. I don't know if it's just location, but we we did more like metal clubs, like Hammerheads and the Dry Rock. And we were doing places like the Right Track Inn, like selling tickets and trying to get people in the door. And you guys had this whole scene that you were already tapped into. And I remember the first show, I think it was the Loyal to None guys came down to see us. It was Brian Smith and Brian Meehan came down to see us at Hammerheads and... uh we talked then, and that's when we, we came up with doing the split 7-inch with Loyal to None and VOD, which was like DTO, I think, in another song. And uh, that was a big moment for us. And um, just those guys coming down, we were just like, holy shit, this is, this is going to be crazy. You know, this is great. And uh, I think they liked it. And then next thing you know it, we were playing. I remember that show we played at Leningrad with, uh, when we played that. And yeah, it was an ex- it was an exciting time. And, and and no, we were not. I don't know what it was. I don't know if we were too metal, but I I just kind of feel like we just we just rushed onto the scene. We had our own little fan base, and that kind of helped out. Like you said, the 13th grade at Nassau, like all people would come, and then we'd mix them up with whatever the scene was that was already there, and things started to get cooking. But uh, yeah, we weren't a part of it originally, and it took a little muscle to get in there, but I feel, you know, we did. <laughs> yeah, you did. And what was interesting about it is that you brought all those other people with you who were people we never saw in the scene. And, and it was, that was awesome because that just meant more people in our scene on Long Island who got to see other bands as well, like Sound Majority and whatnot. And it was, it was, uh, it was, it was when, it, when it hit its height, it was like, holy shit. Like the fucking, the PWAC show where there yeah. was like, my God, I think it was like 2,500 uh, people or something. I mean, and, and you, you guys Tyler just like... King. <laughs> King Size Productions. Um, yeah. oh, oh, is Tyler watching? No, he's not. Bummer. Um, I don't know. But yeah, man. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like so... It was just such a storied thing. And, and, and I got to, you know, give credit to Artie because he really... He saw it. He saw it like firsthand. I mean, I, I like... It just ripped so fucking hard. And it was, it's weird because you guys were like, how long had you guys been playing before you did like that, those angle shows and started coming in to, we were like, I, well, that we, was like, that was probably like 93. Like we played the angle in very early 94. 
maybe even 93. So we were playing, you know, in 92, but we were still building very similar to, you know, we were still trying to find our sound. There was a lot of music going around that there was no fucking screaming on. It was more of a Doors Metallica type thing. And uh, we were still building. But by the, by the time the Hammerhead shows started coming and we started getting into the Leningrad right track in uh, era, if you would, things started to take shape. And um, a lot of that has to do with, you know, the, the VOD music. Obviously, the vocals had, had, had something to do with it, but the music of VOD, especially early on, was, it was very progressive, and it was very heavy. Like, the drums were fucking crazy. Like, I was in the band, and I never heard drums like that. The drums <laughs> were relentless. The riffs were more metal-oriented, and I'll say that with confidence because we were like a metal band at that point. We really, we were like thrashy metal that kind of, we were lucky enough that there was a hardcore scene that took us in, and then our sound even evolved even more. But coming into the game that early, it was more metal, and uh, there wasn't that much going on like that. You know, you had, like, the DAs and the Neglects and the Berserkers, but they were, they were more of a hardcore thing. And as far as I saw on Long Island, we were very metal especially with a lot of double bass. And uh, I think a lot of that was part of that heavy fucking sound that just really blew the doors off stuff. Totally. I mean, and it's interesting because I obviously, Mind Over Matter, we had very busy drums, very, very like yeah. hectic, a weird sort of, yeah, the best. Um, like, you know, almost progressive in its, in its writing style that like uh, Neglect, you, it's interesting to bring up Neglect because Neglect was the band that I, I always felt like they sound like obituary to me musically yeah. you know so like they 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 were the most metal closest to you guys but they had a skinhead singer and so you know brian zoid and zoid. so like they they brought that brought the hardcore element i mean john obviously was was a skinhead guy as well but bones and derek were not they were metalheads and maybe the bones was but like they were like you you guys and them to me are the legendary heavy shit from Long Island. And, you know, it's like, and in the aftermath, we get Glassjaw, you know, we get, we, we get a lot of these bands that like took, as, as Chris Baldwin actually um, <laughs> commenting. Um, <laughs> but in the aftermath, you know, we get a lot of that. And it was weird because the music sort of got lighter as the late nineties came, you know, and you guys just kind of stayed fucking heavy as shit. And, you know, so, so yeah. bring me to, Bring me to um, the, the self-titled record, Getting Signed to Roadrunner. Like, what, like, how did that all happen? <clears throat> well, I'm glad you asked that. That's definitely part of uh, the VOD history. Um, believe it or not, a big part of that signing was Ray Capo when he was with Shelter and he had that imprint on Roadrunner, uh, Super Soul Records. Super, Super Soul, yeah. Yeah, and... Uh, that's how it kind of got sparked. You know, we, the, this is now, now you're getting to the PWAC days where things are getting really big. Um, another big part of the story is we were doing a lot of Roxy shows and Frank Cariola, he really took a liking to us and he would put us on every single national act that came through the Roxy. So now you got us out there. We're doing PWAC. We're doing Roxy. We're doing, uh, any basement show we could fucking find. We're doing radio stations. We're, we're doing the right track in, what's ever left of it. By then, I'm pretty sure the angle's gone. And now we're starting to break into the city. So now people are starting to hear about VOD in the city. Who is this band? People are starting to come down. Like, we're playing Coney Island High, like, every fucking weekend with H2O, 25 to Life, playing with all these crazy fucking bands in the city. And, uh... I guess we started, you know, people started to catch an ear, and it was Howie Abrams who was A and R for Roadrunner with Ray, and we played a show in Pennsylvania, uh, the Mantis Green, and that we played it with Shelter, and that was another weird connection. He started just talking to us. We really like, I really like you guys. Are you guys playing again? I'd love to come and see you. And he, I guess, him and Howie and those guys came to one of the PWAC shows, and within the first riff. They were just like, we got to sign these guys. And uh, 
that's pretty much how that started. And um, we we pretty much we set up for a pretty big record deal, and we started we started recording pretty much right away up in uh, Gloucester, Massachusetts, with a, with Jamie Locke, who did like Madball and some other Roadrunner bands. And uh, you know, we were pretty hungry. A lot of that material was old from like the seven inch some of the demo stuff and then we were also we were writing a lot of music the music was evolving a lot then like vod was getting trippier writing a lot more melodic stuff and uh it was it was progressive on vod's terms and uh we we were just out there doing it and the self-title kind of came together out on the road you know oh well that was that was we started with madball that was our first national tour we're talking about like 96. They took us out. And I remember being like talking to Freddie, being like, how do you fucking do this every night, man? My voice is fucking killing me. He's like, what do you mean? How do you do it? Just, just don't think about it. Just get up and do your thing every night. <laughs> and I was like, all right. <laughs> and, uh, he, you know, he, he, those guys were great, you know, to tour with. They kind of showed us some of the ropes. And then I'll never forget, after that, we went out. Our first real national tour was with us, Earth Crisis, and Downset. And uh, we never been... The furthest we went with Madball was, like, Michigan. So I remember driving, like, on a 15-, 16-hour bender when we first crossed into California. And I was, like, so excited. Everything was so new. And uh, our first show was at, like, Berkeley, California. And, like, we fucking destroyed the place. It was... We sold so much merch that night. They were just like, Downset was like, who the fuck is this band? Like, it was just, uh, it was it was really, really cool. And that was a really exciting tour. Again, everything was fresh. We were making good money. And we were just out on our own, just fucking going berserk. And literally ripping the roof off every single night. First national tour. And then things were really exciting. We were really, really big, I guess, in our own mind. And I guess in re some sort of reality. <laughs> and then we were playing, we played some, yeah, right? We played, yeah, these are, you know, they, things can get shrewd out there. And uh, of course, I'll never forget again. It's all like, a, it's like a series of hookups. Like it's all, a lot of this stuff is all timing and where you at and uh, what, what opera are being presented to you and are you prepared or are you not? And uh we played like another crazy big show with the city in the city. I can't remember the name of the venue right now, but uh, sick of it all came down and they came to the show and they came up to us right after and they just formally offered us their European tour. Do you guys want to come out? We're going out on the road for like six weeks. Come with us to Europe. And this is all in a row, month after month after month. And then I'll kind of end with, that bled right into the Ozfest. So that's like three and a half months of straight touring all through the summer. And it was, it was crazy. You know, the, it's the, so the funny. Ozfest was like rock and roll summer camp. <laughs> you were the first, you were the first yeah. person to tell me about, <laughs> about the second singer behind the curtain for Ozzy, which. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, I don't know, it was always like this really we, poorly I, kept I secret. Know who's supposed to know that? <laughs> did that and we've we've seen him rolled we've seen him rolled off the stage in a wheelchair there was definitely somebody behind the curtain singing a lot of his parts and uh the Ozfest was was really crazy it was just it was like we were a side stage band you know we were really really big and now all of a sudden we were really really small and we were just like the one band on the tour that didn't have a bus everybody's a metal band we're like the only kind of crossover band kennedy was mad that i cut my dreads he he feels that cost us record sales <laughs> uh, <laughs> wow i mean that must have been because yeah. uh, i did i did uh the lincoln park um uh tour i done a bunch of arena tours and always in bands and i would i would imagine yeah. the lincoln park tour we did was uh project revolution and i would imagine doing Ozfest in a van must have been fucking torture. Like, just oh. like what you gotta leave right after you play. You drive sixteen hours. Oh, load ins at eight a.m. It was terrible. <laughs> it was it was terrible. We were. Uh, it wasn't even. A, it was like some weird spaceship of an RV. The name of the driver was Tony Cotton, and he lasted like a week and a half. He like fell asleep at the wheel, and we had to get rid of him. 
And then we hired, we were driving through Atlanta, Georgia, and we hired a very close friend of mine to now be the driver, which little, little, little did we know was like the worst fucking job you could give your friend because basically it's exactly <laughs> what you said. He could not hang out. He literally had to sleep all day and then get up at 10 or 11 or 12 at night and drive us till the next morning. And, uh, yeah, I felt bad for him. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, I still remember like we were just all partying and stuff and he couldn't even hang out. He had to just <laughs> grin it and he didn't, you know, it was, it, you know, our friendship did last, but I did feel bad for him. And, uh, I don't, I'm not sure how long he lasted. He wound up going home and then eventually we did get a bus, but, uh, it was only because every vehicle they gave us broke down, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, these are classic fucking like first time doing all this shit stories, you know, it's, oh, it's yeah. amazing. The uh, so so let's move on to imprint, which is the, you know, probably the biggest cult following album you guys have. Um, and a lot of it was because the label didn't promote it. You guys did your best to promote it on your own. And you guys wind up leaving Roadrunner. So, but the record was, is, was it a record that you were like, were like, shit, this record's great, man. What, give us some fucking money so we can go on is tour this, or. Are we, we're talking about Imprint? Is that what you're yeah. saying? Yeah. Uh, Imprint was, was an animal of a record. I, you know, I don't, I don't know how much you want to know about it, but that came off the heels of all that touring off that first record. And we were really fucking angry. We, we didn't really understand why we were not like bigger than we were and we felt a lot of the music we were at the oz fest and all the tours just sucked and we were just so fucking angry that we recorded like a total red line balls out heavy record we were not gonna sat we were not gonna settle for anything mediocre any we just wanted to rip faces off and that's how that record was born and um we did get some touring out of it. And that was another part of it. Like Roadrunner, there were two deals. You, you might know this, you might not. There were two deals back then that you were going to get from Roadrunner. One was the metal deal, which Machine Head, Fear Factories, Cold Chambers of the World, God, Sepultura. The other deal was the one you were going to get that VOD, Madball, and like some other bands like Primer 55 and stuff like we get, which they were com completely different budgets. And you would get like the hardcore deal, which would meant you were not really getting much. You, they were going to take you for everything you had and not give you much in return. And uh, you didn't get much tour support and they weren't really behind you. And uh, we, I think our A&R guy left. So once that happens, you know, that's bad news, you know, and uh, they always do it so nonchalantly like, oh, sorry, man. You know, it's just not really working out for you guys will be all right. I don't worry. I got so and so watching out for you, and that's like the that's like the kiss of death, you know. And uh, we did we did some touring on Imprint, but what was the nail in the coffin? We were out in uh, I think we were in Australia, and we got to like we did an Australian leg, and then we went to Japan, and the rep the the A and R and the label there was just like you know the label is not really supporting you. The label didn't even want you to come here. We we begged for them for you to be here they wanted typo negative they they were not going to send you and we were just like what that what the fuck are you really yeah. and we were we were getting angry because of that and then we had a dream tour booked up in the uk it was us and i don't know if you remember a band called iron monkey it was yeah they're fucking awesome okay the and it was already sold yeah and it was already sold out it was a sold out tour and um, for a club dates, you know, nothing massive, but it was still great. And they just they said, no, we're not giving you guys the money. You're done. Go start writing your next record. And we were just like, are you fucking kidding me? And that's when the wheels started turning. And Matt and Mike concocted some crazy harebrained scheme to start getting us off a of Roadrunner. And uh, <laughs> we basically <laughs> handed them. Yeah, we handed them like a really bad demo. By then, they owed us the third record, which was a lot of money. And they were like, this is, we're going back. We're so discouraged. We're going back to just being a hardcore band and just doing local shows. This is what you're getting. Give us some money. And that's it. And the guy was just like, 
that it was Monty Connor. He's like, I don't know, something's up here. I wouldn't let these guys go. They got something going on here, but whatever. If you want to let them go, just let them go. And they let us go, and that was it. <laughs> and that's how we got out of Roadrunner. Wow. I mean, so at that point, then you went, it took some time, but you did, uh, well, For the Bleeders was a, uh, um, a re recording of the demos, right? And yeah, then. Yeah, and I think there's one or two extra new songs. Uh, uh, from Bliss to, to Devastation was on TBT. Now, um, I'm sure you have the same story as everybody else who signed the TBT. <laughs> but I mean, well, uh, you know, was was any of that was any of those periods that, enjoyable? That was, like, were you having were you having a good time at least? I mean, you know, you know, what, throughout all this. This time or now like well now no there, no this, like no, i know you're having a good point uh the tbt point yeah um you know things were definitely starting to get more serious then we were all getting a little older we had been a band now for like nine a long time like well over almost 10 or 12 years so some of the relationships were strained uh there were definitely some creative differences but we were optimistic you know labels and management were blowing sunshine up our ass telling us we're going to be fucking enormous on this record we had a really we had a really great producer the material was sounding amazing and uh we were having fun you know there were you know it was a really the tbt deal was a really big deal it was a lot of money so that was cool. You know, we were able to once again quit all our jobs and uh, go tour the world again. And um, we did a good amount of touring on that. And, and the recording, it was a really good recording. Yeah, it, you know, there was some really great stuff that VOD did on those records. From a vocal standpoint, that was probably my, my voice really matured. And working with Machine as a brought me to the next level. I believe that he really pushed me and brought me to a new level. And that's what a good producer does. Like if you heard the TVT demos from the demos to the tracks on the record, it's like, holy shit, this guy really, he really got me and really, really produced me to a point where I felt I had become like a, a real contender uh, as a, as a, in terms of singers, you know, and, uh, it was very exciting, you know. I had moved to the city by then. Things were fucking crazy. The party was raging, if you if you <laughs> could imagine. You know, things were uh, things were things were wild. You know, I was living on Avenue B and Sixth Street, and uh, I was all in. You know, things things were great, and it was before the Trade Center, so things were you know things were good. We we, we were doing really well. We shot a really big video for a lot of money, and uh, it was an exciting time. But there was a couple of funny quotes. I, it might have been Don Fury who heard like that we got signed to TVT. And I think his quote was, there goes uh, Sean Roberts playing with Stephen Gottlieb's money again. Those guys don't realize that they just jumped out of the, fry, out of the frying pan right into the fire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Don was going through a lot of shit at that time with TVT for sure. Yeah, the, 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 uh, yeah it's a... It, it, it's it's crazy like what TBT was doing at that time and they, they, they did have a shit ton of money. I mean, all that Nine Inch Nails money they were throwing around yeah. and all that shit. And, you know, like, well, Day in Life was on TBT and Still Suit. Oh, and yeah. you, obviously, you guys were friends with both those bands. Sure. Um, sure. You know, and, and especially with George Reynolds, who, you know, I, I feel like you and George are pretty close for uh, during, yeah, George, during that time particularly. Great. It's great. And uh, I mean, it's it's. Well, we uh, took those guys on tour. Yeah, yeah, many times, right? Well, it was us. The big tour was. I think Still Suit was on it too. It was Still Suit and Day in the Life and VOD on. Uh, I think it was the Bliss record, and we, you know, we were out there with those. It might have been. I think it was that record. We were out there with those guys for a long time. I, you know, I get along with all those guys. George, George is great. Well, the Fleischman brothers, obviously. Had a, oh yeah, oh, <laughs> had a connection yeah. there. <laughs> Get it, man. That's that's a, that's its own universe. Those guys. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love all that shit, man. It's so funny, like to t like 
ha during that period, it made me very happy to see, you know, all the bands from Long Island that had gotten big, but also that everybody had stayed tight. And, you know, like, I mean, not Taking Back Sunday and brand new, but, you know, other shit, like, <laughs> you know, it was just, it was yeah. cool to watch, you know, and then I, I was actually, um, we can get into Blood, uh, Blood Simple now, because uh, what, what, uh, so what was the final nail in the coffin of VOD the first time? Like, what, what did it? Well, I mean, you don't have to talk about it. Like if it's the uncomfortable, catalyst but. was, uh, you know, it's not, it's nothing that, it's not, it's a garden variety band story, you know, uh, like I would, like I, I alluded to, the relationships were very strained by then. We had gone into the TVT record, very optimistic. We had a new sound, which was pretty risky, but we were all kind of, we were all excited about it. And there was a lot of, a lot of sunshine being blown up our asses from management, labels, booking, and um, it all came tumbling down and it didn't go as planned. So that was very discouraging. Uh, uh, you know, and then by this point, the band, me and Kennedy felt like the band was kind of missed, like VOD was kind of losing something. And we were, we were in Europe doing, attempting to do Tattoo the Planet. We all know what happened with that. That was the, uh, the, the Trade Center came down. Right, right. There was a lot of death, a lot of personal loss around that that definitely contributed to the VOD being done. And uh, I still remember me and Kennedy sitting in, on a double deck of bus in England waiting for this fucking tour to start and talking about we need to go back home and we need to, when we go home, we need to start a heavy band. You know, it's time. This will be more of like a heavy project. I think me and you should go together. And, um, it, you know, that's pretty much what we started to, to talk about. And the Trade Center went down. We got stuck in Europe for like two and a half weeks trying to do show after show after show. Meanwhile, Slayer is sitting at home in their pools waiting for a buyout. Like they were just waiting for more money because Pantera canceled. But we're sitting there just trying to survive. So we canceled and came home. And my dad had passed away. Uh, a couple of close friends lost relatives in the Trade Center. And it just... That was it. It was we weren't going to go back out on the road. And that was he was done. And um, uh, me and Kennedy started exchanging demos within weeks. And there was a building period for Blood Simple. Me and Mike were, you know, we were we were slow to start. But then things started to catch fire. And we, we got uh, a guitar player that really got our vision and helped elevate the, the music. And that was that puts us at around 2001. And I would say it took about three or four years to about, like, I won't go through all the downtime, but it took about till 2005 for Blood Simple to develop to a point where we had gotten signed. And uh, that came out of another connection uh, through Chad from Mudvayne. They started, we started doing demos and they caught wind of it and he wanted to sign us. And that happened very quickly. It was like we had, barely any management a little we were doing some local shows and then next thing you know it we go and see Mudvayne. we open up for them like two or three nights next thing you know it they're flying us out to california to do showcases and for like major fucking labels and uh <clears throat> warner brothers bit and uh that was it well you guys you got that i mean blood simple was knee deep in the fucking new metal scene for sure and you yeah. know, it was, uh, yeah. I mean, that was the time. I like, I, I got, you know, my band instruction got lumped into that, got signed to Geffen. Uh, we weren't even remotely as heavy as you guys were. So, <laughs> touring with touring with bands like Corn was like almost like embarrassing. It was like, uh, yeah, cool, man. <laughs> like their fans are just like, get this fucking band off stage. Why is this guy singing? I don't understand. But uh, I, mean, I remember seeing you actually. I remember seeing you uh, at Download Festival. Um, in 2006 is I was with Gay for Johnny Depp and we had played uh, the, the Snickers stage. Um, right. And we were all hanging out backstage. And actually, if I remember correctly, that was when Axl Rose walked backstage. And we were, we, oh, I remember yeah. talking to you, we, I was talking to all you, I hadn't seen you guys in ages. And we were talking for a while and Axl Rose walked and like security moved us to the side so that <laughs> Axl could like walk down like a fucking, yeah. like a parade. Yeah. 
Oh my God, it's so fucking ridiculous. Yeah, but uh, it was great to see you that day, by the way. That was that was a super fun day. That totally made my, you know, that, that festival was fun, but like that totally made my day. But uh, I always love that when you're, you're going around the world and you, and you find, you know, people that you've known forever and like, you know, it's like come from your scene and you're oh, like, yeah. oh shit, what's up, dude? Holy shit. Yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah. you're like, you just immediately get each other and there's no, you know, it's like, yeah. Uh, it, and you're, you're surrounded by all these rock stars and all this weird shit going on. But it's like, yo, man, I'm from North Belmont. You're from fucking North yeah. America. What up? <laughs> yeah no it's it's, it's uh, those are some of the special moments out there when you hook up with your boys and uh just because those festivals especially download can be so overwhelming there's so like people don't realize the amount of pressure that's put on you to do that festival you know it's a it's an old how you been doing during the uh during the quarantine and and all this shit i mean i know the point of these interviews is to get at all this shit but like How's it? You, know, you working? You like what are you doing? I stay, you know, I stay pretty busy. I was off for a little while. Uh, you know, we were. You know, it's I guess like eighty days the thing started, and uh, I was working for a while, but then we went into like weird shift mode, and we were off, and then we were on, we were off, then we were on. So I was home a lot, like we were saying earlier, with uh, everybody, you know, the family and stuff. So. That was, uh, you know, it was good. <laughs> and and uh, now I'm, I'm pretty busy these days, uh, I guess three or four weeks now. Um, my wife is pretty immersed. She does. She's doing some pretty big uh, nonprofit stuff. So she's staying pretty busy trying to uh, she's putting together like PPEs and stuff like that. So that keeps that keeps things very busy around here. And uh, I kind of just stay out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> I found it actually that I'm busier now because of like how much setup and breakdown it takes to like run a bar and do shit. It's oh, like, yeah. like everything's so fucking weird and they have so all these regulations that are completely all over the place. And you don't know what's the right thing to do and what's the wrong thing to do. And and frankly, like, I don't think this thing is over. Of course it's not, but it needs to turn around and start worrying about the vulnerable people and let people live their lives and do things that they need to do, at least in my opinion. Yeah. But you know, I'll keep wearing a mask. I'll keep playing by the rules, be just out of you know courtesy to my fellow man. But um, but like it's yeah. it, it's kind of time, you know. And if I don't know, like we don't know what's gonna happen with fucking school. God help me, God, school's got to start in September. Holy shit, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna yeah. lose it. <laughs> I don't know. You know, it's been it's been very hard. You know, the schools have been out, so that's been extremely challenging. Uh, yeah, you know, it, the Bronx was hit pretty hard. Um, it was pretty scary for a little while there. Uh, you didn't really know which way it was going to go. I'm glad that things, they, they seem to be on top of it. I agree with you that I don't think it's over. I don't, it's really tough. Like, I don't really watch the news. I do, like, four news sources that I trust, two right wing and two left wing, and I kind of just meet in the middle. And the rest I get from my wife. She's fucking crazy involved with all that. Yeah, I was going to say, and... she sounds like she's got the she's got a little bit of an inside track on a lot of the, like, yeah, the real yeah. shit. Yeah, yeah that's that's nice lot. to have. It's yeah, it's good. It's good. And um, I, I, I just I don't feel that it's over. I agree with you with that. It's rough. You know, I, I think uh, I think. I think the summer, I think we're going to be all right. I think things are going to slowly start to come back. But I think the masks, I think it's pretty, I agree with like things are never going to be the same kind of like things were not the same after 9-11. You won't notice it in a couple of years, but things are never going to be the same. No. It's going to never go back to the way it was. It'll become the new normal. Um, this whole riot thing is incredible. And it's it's really it's to have that happen on the on the cusp of the COVID thing. Like we were driving down, me and my buddy, my partner were driving down Fordham Road last week, and it was fucking depressing. Like windows, every bank was hit, every store was hit, every things that were boarded up were ripped down. Cops everywhere people wearing masks it was it was literally like a war zone like i felt from where i work to i cut across town to where i had to go 
I was like depressed when I got to where I had to be just like, yeah. I couldn't believe that what, what I just witnessed. And to me, that was really scary because you didn't, you really didn't know what was going to happen. They were talking about, they didn't know, they didn't know which way this thing was going to go. I'm not going to say anything. You know, I, I, I feel terrible for everybody who was involved in that. People need to be held accountable but I don't really have much else to say on the matter. Yeah, I feel I feel like it's it's just better off not to get to like we're not experts on anything, you know. So like, there's no reason for us right. to have to right. say anything. We're also not politicians, which you know it's it's crazy. Like one of the people that I've found that has been very helpful is Justin Brannon, the guitar player from Indecision, who's uh he's a city councilman for mm. Bay, for Bay Ridge in Brooklyn. And uh, he's been like so on this shit, man. And it's like it's so awesome to see a hardcore kid be involved in politics like that, where he's yeah. like he's an elected official, That's and he's like, and the things he's saying That's are smart and they're fucking great. And uh, you know, like it's awesome to see one of us making a real fucking difference, man. It's fucking great. Um, so I want to get back great. into um, uh, I want to get. So we were talking about Blood Simple, and uh, mm. so what was the so how did that end? Like what, you know? Uh, well, that, um, you know, <laughs> that ended pretty fucking wildly. But um, I'll, I'll uh, stick to the G-rated version. Blood Simple was fucking out of control, you know? VOD was crazy, but VOD was not completely off the rails, you know? VOD had certain elements that kept certain people grounded, whereas blood, the cuffs were off and people were going fucking crazy and somebody was going to kill somebody or somebody was going to die. That's really the only way I can explain it. It was, it was, uh, it was full on pandemonium all the time. And uh, there were no restraints. Everything was encouraged. And it was just flat out. It was dangerous, man. I was in situations that I could have been easily killed. And um, people broke. What was that revolving around? Was that revolving around? Was that revolving? Was that revolving around drugs or was it revolving around like just uh, like shady people situations? Drugs drugs and shady situations, you know, that and uh, a lot of travel, just constantly being gone not having any repercussions for any uh, any of our behaviors and um it was just nuts man you know and um we were playing some really really big tours and uh things were things were just out of control and uh um the first record they poured so much money into us it was crazy it was the biggest record deal i've ever been a part of and um Anyway, we went, the credit cards came out and there was a lot of big shows, a lot of, you know, a lot of big time people around, drugs and a lot of, a lot of partying, you know, and uh, a lot of people bought into that. And uh, the first, the first, the first record, we had a gigantic team, like 20 people, all for us, pushing all for us, man. And uh, it was showing, we were getting some really big numbers and we were, we were breaking on the radio, which was unheard of for VOD you know you'd be driving through like Texas and you'd hear like a corn song a blood simple song and then a mud vein song at like three o'clock in the afternoon and uh you know we would show up to these we'd show up to like Green Bay and play a show and play like we never had like a hit single and the crowd would just go fucking berserk you'd play the song in like Kansas City and the whole crowd is just going boom, 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 boom. We playing the Fillmore in Colorado, and just that it was just on, man. Like the shows, we were doing the Jägermeister tour, we were doing Family Values, we were doing Mudvayne shows, we were going to uh, Europe with Event Sevenfold. Like that, it was just sold out everywhere we went, and uh, we really a lot of us had. And uh, the second record came up, and we were ready for it. We recorded it, and uh, the, the, we got the kiss of death. The a r guy left. Things started to get a little shaky. Now, now the records aren't really selling as much, so people are losing their jobs. And uh, 
one after the no after the other, people were leaving Warner Brothers, and we were kind of left in that in that niche with no representation. And you know what happens when that happens. So we probably, we pretty much did uh, we did some Mudvayne, we did some Hell Yeah tours, which were very very good. We were doing really well, and um, we did Family Values, and that, and then we went to Australia, and then that was it. We came home. It, once again, I don't know what it is with these bands, but the country would now was heading into a major recession, and uh, they were just like, bands just aren't going anywhere. You guys are going to go home, and we'll see what happens. And uh, it was now we're all in our mid-30s. You couldn't really be without you. We were living in New York City. We had to, we had to get going. You had to stay busy. One right. thing led to another. Everybody got caught up in their personal lives and their careers, and uh, Blood Simple pretty much just disintegrated so so but vod how quickly was it that vod reformed after that it's like once again it's like no time at all like i don't know if it's me i just you know i gotta keep busy with my music stuff but it was just the, the time is right there was a lot of talk blood simple was doing that thing but slowly, VOD, like, the VOD started to be introduced again. Like, uh, uh, we did, like, the Super Bowl. Like, we were asked. We got an offer. We couldn't refuse to do the Super Bowl of Hardcore. That was just, like, full VOD lineup, original music. I still remember going out that day, meeting uh, up in the morning and doing imprint that as a sound check and being like, holy fuck, this is sick, man. I haven't, I haven't sung this shit in so long. And... It was incredible. Like people were going, it was just a sound check and the 30 or 40 people setting up gear and hanging out were going like fucking nuts. So it was, it was very powerful. And, uh, and then Blood Simple was doing a headliner. I don't know. You remember that? Not Club Revolution. Like Club Ritual was out on, uh, on Jericho. On, yeah, uh, yeah. The Tenstead Turnpike on the Wontor Parkway. Yeah, yeah. We were doing a lot of shows for them. And, uh, we had, we had Blood Simple come in and did a headliner, and VOD did a secret show. And uh, it was, you know, your typical secret show flyer, and we did, like, four songs. And that was the first time VOD had been on stage. So that was, like, 2008 or nine or something. The original members, we were sound checking, and it was just like, holy shit, you know, we're actually doing this. And I still remember when VOD, Blood Simple played that night, and then VOD came on as the encore, and the place just piled in. Oh, like, of course, yeah. Just heads, like a wall of people, and we kicked into, like, I think we did Choke into DTO, and that's all we did. We did, like, a melody, you know, like three or four, three or four parts, and it was like an avalanche of people, and at the end of the songs, Nick, the guitar player VOD of Blood Simple was just like standing in front of his amp being like, you guys need to go back and do that. Like why <laughs> you guys, not, you guys should just do VOD. <laughs> and, uh, that, that, that's what happened. We, you know, it was, we started, you know, we started thinking about, you know, we started doing some headliners and they were very well received. And then we did a couple of international dates that were well received. And then we started talking about a record, and Matt Baumbach wasn't into it. It took it took a while to uh, get him to come around, but he eventually did. I remember uh, I took him. We met at a, like a hate breed show out at uh, what's that other venue that's out on? Um, it was there for a while. Uh, what the fuck venue was that? A lot if of it's bands, on Long Island. A lot of if it's on Long Island. I'm not going to remember because it's, I haven't lived out there in ages. <laughs> I know it's on the tip of my tongue. I can't remember now, but I guess it doesn't matter. But it was in Huntington, and it was Hatebreed was playing. So oh, I the met Paramount Matt down at the show, and it I was got at the, it. it wasn't it had Paramount because the... Paramount wasn't around yet. It was, it was some of the Crazy Donkey. That's what it was. Oh, the Crazy Donkey. donkey. Right. El Burro Loco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I got I got uh, bound back to meet me down at a Hatebreed show. Um, I got I bought him. I got him good and good and drunk, and then I started hitting him with the questions, and uh, he 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 came on board, and uh, that's when we wrote um, uh, the curse remain cursed, and that was pretty yeah. Well which I was going to say, you know, like, like, back. those two records, the two records you've made since you were back together are just really, I mean, fucking incredible. Like it just, Thanks. like it just ripped. It was like. 
it was like a like an uber mature version of what you guys did and like the lyrics the the performances everything was so fucking good like i i mean I, i'm not gonna tell i'm not gonna say that i like doubted that it would be good but like i didn't think it would be that fucking good that's <laughs> like i was like shit, especially <laughs> fucking uh, race, uh, race to the ground dude like i put that shit on i was like what the fuck and like you know wow. like, it Thank just you. was like you know and it brought back a lot of memories you know it's like like you guys are you guys are fucking legends you know it, uh, of course like you guys went on to do a lot bigger things but our little world was such a you know it, it, as much as it branched out and a lot of bands got big it was really like a special time and it was like you know for 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 us it was like you know it was like playing in the minor leagues and you know and you're working yeah. you know you're you're getting your shit together and then all of a sudden you know and like all these people came out to support it it was such a special time and you guys like you guys juggernauted to the top of the echelon so quickly and 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 didn't disappoint like that's for me personally you know, and I've said this before, uh, I forget who I was interviewing was, uh, um, I don't know if it was, no, I wasn't, I was, I was gonna say like, uh, some of the sound majority guys, like whatever, like for me personally, like I, and it's weird to say this, but I have a lot of pride in right. the bands that came in the aftermath of Mind Over Matter and, and like a lot of the, and neglect and all that shit. And like, man, you know, it's like, you guys didn't disappoint. You didn't disappoint. There wasn't a moment that it Thank was like, I was like, that I was like, yo, fuck this band. They suck now. It's like, no, they keep evolving. They keep changing. They keep, you know, like you started singing more, super cool. Like, I, I just like, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, maybe I've had too much White Claw, but yeah. The, the, no, uh, no, thank <laughs> you. I, it's really good to hear. I really appreciate it. And it's respected from somebody like you, you know, and, uh, you know, those records, those last two records, they were interesting because, you know, VOD, we had a lot of time away from each other. So we all, everybody had time to reset. Everybody had time to possibly surrender their egos, which you know how it is in bands. Very, very tough and very, very complex relationships over many, many years. So uh, the hatchet was buried, if you would, especially on Curse Remain Cursed. And we were able to just kind of sit down and write music again. There wasn't any pressure because there really wasn't a label at that point. And when the label did finally come around, they were just like, here's the check. Do whatever the fuck you want. We know it's going to be fucking great. Just call us when it's done, and we'll we'll take it from there. And, uh, you know, the curse remained cursed. VOD, we had a lot of, we, we had matured, and we were able to write better songs. And we also grew, me, even even Matt Baumbach would say, you know, we, we, you know, I did a lot of, I did so many shows over the years that my live game had really evolved. Like I remember we did Hellfest in Europe. With oh, VOD I saw the footage and Matt of that. Had never done festivals Dude. like that. Kennedy, Dude, had, yeah, holy Kennedy shit! Has done a lot of big festivals. And it was, Matt was just like, what the fuck? He couldn't believe that we were able to rally and just get that crowd whipped into such a fucking frenzy. He was like, I, I can't, I've never seen you perform like that. This is, this is unbelievable. And uh, you're completely fucking different. I can't, I can't believe how good you are now. And, you know, that's coming from Matt, who's a pretty critical guy. And, uh, that's what it, you know, I, I had evolved that as a singer, we have, evolved you know the curse remain cursed we've evolved as songwriters and singers to where we were able to create a better song and we also knew what what sounded good like what what in vod what grabs the fans what what are we gonna play that's gonna fucking translate to a good vod song and a lot of that attitude went into the curse remain cursed and then you know unfortunately when we got to uh, raise to the ground, we actually did that as a four piece, which I, I, I was, right. I was going to say, Josh wasn't, Kennedy Josh wasn't in the, do. he was, Josh wasn't in the, in the, in the, in the fold yet. Right. Like, no, nah, no, nah, was... Deco, <laughs> Deco wasn't in Deco. Deco was, was Deco's great is great, but he wasn't, he did not play on the record. And uh, 
and I don't, he didn't write it. He just wasn't really there for the writing of the record, so we didn't play on it. But I also was very adamant that I really wanted Mike Kennedy to play by himself. I, it was time. I knew he could handle it. He was writing some really good stuff. And I really just, I didn't want somebody else to come in and, and fuck it up. I wanted Mike to, for lack of better term, it was Mike's time to shine. Yeah, and, dude. Uh, that, and that guy, yeah, I really, really, you know, like, it, really, it, it, it's crazy, like, watching him play. Like, he, I mean, he's a different person, too, from, you know, when you guys were in Blood Simple, you know, and, it, it, you know, he stopped drinking and, and doing whatever and, like, you know, like, kind of became, like, an entrepreneur. And, you know, like, it, just a, like, right. a really, like, I fucking love hanging out with Mike. It's just so interesting how different he was from that time, you know, and, 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 yeah. yeah, that that was probably a fucking killer thing to, for you to push because he's a great guitar player and he writes sick riffs. It's like fuck it, man. Yeah. You know, like I, yeah. I, I was. He, and he was he was writing some he was writing some really really great riffs, and uh, it was just his time. You know, Matt was Matt stepped down, and it, it was just I'm like I'm not getting another fucking guitar player. You could do this, and he knew he could do it, and it, I think and that was it, and. Uh, we were able to pull that record off again. We we suffered some label setbacks, but it got out, and we were very very happy with it. And uh, you know, I don't know what's going on now, but you know, there's always chatter. <laughs> you know, yeah. my booking agent, you know, my book my booking agent, who I'm still pretty close with, he's always calling me, being like, he books a lot of bands, and he's just like, you're the most fucking requested band on my roster. You guys gotta fucking play. And I don't know if he's just trying to, you know, because if we play, he gets paid. I don't know if he's just trying to, you know, <laughs> sell me or whatever. But he's that's a, he says that every time, and I'm just like, well, you got you guys, you guys in you guys in Glassjaw are like, are, are you guys in Glassjaw are like super elusive. So you know, it's a right. it's it's sort of like a fucking unicorn when you actually play, and it's <laughs> it's but that's cool, man. It, it it keeps it fresh. I mean, obviously, this whole current situation is throwing a wrench in the works for anybody doing anything. But, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it, it, I mean, I, I hope to see you back on stage again soon. And uh, I'm going to wrap it up. And I, I want to yeah. thank you so much, Tim. It was great to fucking talk to you, dude. It's always great to see you. Yeah. Um, you know, like, it's, uh, we go way back. And it's, it's crazy, like, yeah, to, way to, back. to think, think of all the fucking crazy shit we all went through together. And, and, and again, like I said, I was always like, like, fuck yeah, VOD, fucking keep going, keep fucking killing it, because you deserved everything you got, and, you know, you worked hard for it, and it fucking kicked ass. So, um, you know, no, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. You know, we, right, always, cool. we always were a big supporter, big supporter of you and everything you've done with the bar, and, you know, even back in the matchless days when I used to come down and you would feed totally. me fucking shots. <laughs> you know, I was, always, I was always happy to see you. And I was always happy to watch you evolve and grow and through everything. And especially, you know, big props to St. Vitus and all your guys' success. I love, I love telling people that, you know, that's, that's my fucking friend's bar when we're driving down Manhattan Avenue. I'm like, do you have any idea what fucking bands play in that fucking bar? You would never even fucking know. And uh, it's, always, it's always been great to know you. And I really appreciate this opportunity. I'm glad it worked out. And I'm glad we were able to pull off the mighty Instagram live. <laughs> it's awesome, man. All right. Kudos to you and your family. Have a good night. Get some sleep. Yeah. And uh, I'll hopefully see yeah. you soon, buddy. You got it, bro. Take care. Let it. Yeah.